You know, the spirit of wisdom, when it's operating in you, is a department of the Holy Spirit where he, he shows you uh, where he is quickening you to become something or to do something. So everybody has a different quickening dependent on the position they have because if someone is a child, imagine their quickening is going to be towards their parents. If someone is a um, janitor, their quickening is going to be towards cleaning tables. Their quickening is going to be towards uh, taking out trash, recognizing spills. If someone is a governor, their quickening is going to be on their city, their state. Laws, protocols, crime. The, the production in the land. So quickening is a department of the Holy Spirit for wisdom. And the wisdom points you to a specific area where God wants to be worshipped by you. Moses and Joshua are both worshiping God, but not for the same part. Moses is worshiping God to lead the people. Joshua is worshiping God to serve Moses. Their positions are different from their quickening. Their quickening is being decided by their positions. So when you're being quickened by God, it is wisdom being pointed in a specific area. Not every area, a specific area. You know, somebody can't tell you that you're fearful if you don't want to bungee jump because you may not be anointed by God or scheduled by God to bungee jump. Fear can only be measured when it's an instruction from God. Like if somebody says, I bet you won't put a gun to your head and shoot yourself. And they say, well, you won't do it because you're fearful. Well, they can't say that you're fearful because it's not even an anointing to put the gun to your head and shoot yourself. You see what I'm saying? So oftentimes in life, uh, there are things that you say like, I, I, I'm fearful to do it when the better phrase for you to say it is that I'm, I'm not anointed by God to do it. I have no anointing to do this. Like somebody might say, uh, I bet you won't eat a hundred cockroaches. And they say, well, you fearful because you won't eat a hundred cockroaches, but you're not anointed to eat a hundred cockroaches. You see what I'm saying? Fear can only be measured when God, the Holy Spirit is quickening you to become or do something and you don't become it or do it. Now, when the Word of God talked about perfect love, it shows you that there's different stages to love. And perfect love is the highest stage because it casts out fear, which means it casts out the voice of Satan that suggests that you shouldn't do a thing. So when we look at the aspect of fear, fear is um, it's a um, it's a approach that the kingdom of darkness uses so that what God does want to come out of you, you would restrain yourself from doing it. When the word of God talked about Job, it said that Job said that which I feared has come upon me. Which means that Job had Satan with a percentage of Job's brain talking to it. And he feared what Satan was saying. But the time came where what Satan was saying came to pass. What you fear is a percentage of your brain 
that Satan is interpreting concerning God's plan. I want you to hear this. Remember, I told you, you can't fear what's not scheduled by God. I, um, um, when I say that, I want to explain it. Fear can only be measured if something is scheduled by God and you have given a percentage of your brain over to not doing it. So fear resists God. Fear takes away the ambition to accomplish something. So when you get into fear, there is not a place where you are entertaining to go forth with something that God is saying. There's, there is, there is now a dedication to the wrong direction. And let me show you this in the scripture. Remember Elijah it's fear of what Jezebel said. I'm going to take your head off. And then the fear is um, being empowered because he, he has a documentation that she already took people's head off. So there is an angle of fear where you have observed something happening the way that is being presented to you is going to happen. Because what was presented to Elijah was something that he had documentation, it had already happened. She had already killed some prophets. So when she's saying that she's going to kill him, it's something that is not like he didn't see it with his physical eyes. Okay, so let me show you something. Elijah prays according to his fear. But look at what his prayer is saying. Don't use me to go forth with what I am scheduled to do. So God says to go anoint Elisha because God is saying, I'll have to use another person to do it. So you understand what is the objective of fear when Satan um, is copying God's method? Because God's fear leads to wisdom, but Satan's fear leads to weariness and wickedness and unwillingness. So when Satan bootlegged the law of fear, it was to stop wisdom. Because God's invention of fear was to start wisdom. So when God wanted to start wisdom in one's life, he made the law of fear because fear was going to direct them into wisdom. But when Satan wanted to stop wisdom, Satan bootlegged the law of fear copied it from God so that when someone receives the spirit of fear, they'll become prisoners and producers of folly, foolishness, wrong decisions. As you're joining in, I want you to share this broadcast. Share this broadcast right now. Everybody, I need you to share this. I need you to share this word. Let the gospel penetrate the soul of somebody because of you. So let me show you this here. If you allow yourself to become complacent with the fear of the Lord. Everybody's life is in either or, or fear. Like you're either in the fear of God or the fear of the God of this world. 
Because everybody that's not living by God's system, they're not living by the kingdom of heaven, they are in the bracket of the fear of Satan. Now, there's another aspect of fear. We know fear being like you're intimidated to do something or like you're, you're avoiding to do something. If somebody fears that a dog is going to chase them while they're running, they won't run down that path. The disciples, most of them, was not at the cross because of fear. So even though they know I'm supposed to be at the cross supporting Jesus, their fear is, no, I don't want to get crucified. No, I don't want nobody to see me affiliated with him. So the fear is blocking out an ability that they do have. Peter is walking on water with a new ability from Jesus. But through fear, the ability stops. We see in the word of God that Daniel never leaves the ability of God. He keeps praying. He stays in the ability of God. And now an angel shuts the mouth of the lions that came to eat him. So you understand that when you're in the fear of God, and Daniel was in the fear of God, in the fear of God, supernatural things happen that override your fear of something that look like it is commonly and like it, it's, it's common to happen. Like you already have documentation. If somebody is around lions, they get ate by the lions. But if you avoid the fear of Satan, the fear of God brings the power of God. And the power of God overall uh, overrides the law that the fear of Satan has made so common that it is definite to happen. Okay, so let me just show you something. The woman with the issue of blood, there's documentation that woman bled to death. There's documentation that woman actually kept that condition all their life. But she leaves the fear of Satan. She chooses the fear of God and it starts wisdom. Let me show you something. Remember I told you wisdom is the Holy Spirit quickening you of something that he wants you to become, something he wants you to do. So watch this here. When she follows wisdom, she becomes the woman that she was made to be. And she becomes the woman that does what she's supposed to do. So, okay, so what is this woman's purpose? To touch Jesus. To touch Jesus in her emotions. To touch Jesus in her relationships that she picked for her life. You know when you touch Jesus with relationships, it's because you have sanctified yourself and you only allow yourself to open up to people that are a part of the divine schedule, not people that are convenient, not people that you work with, not people in your neighborhood. Because, see, when you are in God's schedule, you'll have a neighbor that lives right next to you and the Holy Spirit will never tell you to talk with them. The Holy Spirit will never tell you to lock, knock their door. There are times where you'll have somebody right at your co-worker place and the Holy Spirit not telling you to give them your phone number or eat lunch with them or go on a date with them or go to a movie with them. But yet they are right in proximity to you. So just think about this. This woman, her whole purpose is to touch Jesus. Because if you notice, when she rejects the fear of Satan, chooses the fear of God, it leads her into a quickening of what she's supposed to do. And watch this here. Even though there was a law in the natural that when a woman had this condition, she's not supposed to be out and about. You notice she rejects all logic.
to stick to her purpose. Now, in order for her to overcome the fear of Satan, she has to overcome embarrassment. She has to overcome the possibility of it not working. She has to overcome ridicule, persecution. But see, wisdom is so powerful that you start to embark on the boldness of the lion you are supposed to be according to your purpose. When someone operates in the wisdom of God, they're operating in a potent power that's greater than all levels of witchcraft. That when someone has wisdom, they have a aura of God sitting on them. Where God cannot be tempted by evil, you step into a zone where evil becomes a nuisance. You become irritated and bothered with a zero tolerance for evil. That's why Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Hating evil is a higher plane than the the average man, the average woman. Because think about it. You come into this world learning how to embrace evil. You come into this world learning how to adapt to evil. You come into this world learning how to continue evil. So what place is this where the Bible talks about wisdom, which is really the fear of the Lord. And when it says the fear of the Lord, it's really talking about wisdom because the fear of the Lord starts wisdom. It's saying that wisdom is a place where you hate what the majority of the population of the earth loves. So no wonder the world, the Bible would say that Marvin not the world hates you. Why would they hate you? Because you have stepped into a place of wisdom. And remember, I told you wisdom is to be quickened, to be the person that Jesus wants you to be and to fulfill the things that Jesus wants you to fulfill. I need everybody to share this broadcast right now as you're joining on. I need you to share this broadcast to your page. So why do we look in the word and see that the Bible is telling you that in the life of Thomas, he has a theology that is impossible for Jesus to have returned back from the dead. He needs evidence. We know that he's not in faith, so he's in fear. Because if you're not in faith, you've got to be in fear. But what has gone on with Thomas all these moments that he was around Jesus? That means that while Jesus is setting people free, Thomas himself, through the fear of Satan, blocks the power of God that will set him free. He blocks the glory realm of wisdom. So what is happening in all the moments where Jesus is teaching the people, blessed are those that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, they shall be filled. What's going on with Thomas' brain while he's hearing all these things? How 
How is it that Thomas not start having a hate for evil? How is it that Thomas doesn't have confidence in the supernatural? Because Jesus rising from the dead, coming back again, is the supernatural. So why is it his faith? If he's hearing the word, because the Bible said faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word. So if he's hearing the word, how come he doesn't have faith? Hereby you understand that the flesh, the fear of Satan is able to damage the channel of God's laws. If you have the fear that Satan gives, things that are in the bracket of power and glory in the supernatural and it's part of the plan of God for you. Those things will not happen. Thomas was right in the realm of the fear of Satan and despite seeing all that Jesus is saying and doing, none of that is affecting his brain. His brain is not saying that this is possible. His brain is not receiving the resurrection. His brain is not accepting the power of God. Now, Thomas is being told by a woman that her brain used to be in the fear of Satan. Her name is Mary Magdalene. Here's a woman that mastered the fear of Satan and God's will was not happening in no department of her life. She is coming to someone that Jesus came to rescue way before her. And now she is trusted by Jesus, not him. Let me ask you a question. How is it that Thomas needs to be told something by someone that came way after him? It means that all the times that he's with Jesus, he is not meeting the quota, the criteria, the balance sheet. It means that during the duration of time that he's with Jesus, he's not making any, any motion. He's not moving forward. He's not going forward to the next place. See, Thomas was around Jesus. Mary Magdalene was in Jesus. Thomas was in Jesus' company. But Mary Magdalene was in Jesus' chamber. Both are hearing this same Jesus talk. The words are falling in Thomas's fear of Satan, which is the belief in natural laws. That's why many people don't get healed or they never become rich 
according to the word of God. The Bible said that the blessing of the Lord make you rich. They never become rich because they have faith. Fear, the fear of Satan is faith in the natural laws. Wow. They have faith in the natural laws. So Thomas is saying, I haven't seen nobody come back from the dead. I haven't seen nobody, according to this natural law, do what Jesus is saying. So the fear of Satan is interpreting Jesus' words throughout the duration of time that Jesus is talking to Thomas. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Throughout the duration of time that Jesus is talking to Thomas, it's not being mixed with faith. The words are dropping in the column. Of the fear of Satan. And so even when Jesus rises from the dead and they're telling him Jesus has risen. Thomas is the dummy boy. You notice that his reaction revealed how stupid he was. They're telling him he's alive. We, we know it. We, he's alive. He's, it, Mary Magdalene, she's seen him. Everybody. Mary Magdalene is telling him, I saw him. And he's telling him, no. You see, you see what the fear of Satan does. Mary Magdalene has physical documentation of encountering Jesus. And he's saying, no, I don't believe. What do you think is going on in Mary Magdalene's mind? Don't think for one moment that Mary Magdalene didn't look at Thomas and say, Am I really hearing this coming out of him? Don't think, what is going on psychologically with Mary Magdalene when she sees a disciple, meaning somebody that has been trained, resisting the truth? What do you think is going on with Mary Magdalene psychologically? She came in way after this man. When she came in, this man was in the fold. When she came in, Thomas was eating and drinking with Jesus. When she came in, Thomas was up there walking to villages on boats with Jesus. She came in long after Thomas had already been through trips, adventures, assignment, ministry, tasks. And when she talks to Thomas, somebody that's supposed to understand the realm of God, Thomas says to her, you are a liar. It's not possible. Huh? Saints. Mary Magdalene was disappointed. You know, I can go talk to somebody on the streets right now and tell them that Jesus wrote, and they can look at me and say I'm lying, and even though I would think that they're foolish, it, there'll be some reasoning within there because, hey, you, you wasn't with him throughout the duration of his life. You don't know him like that according to uh, documented acts and works. Remember, you, you didn't get to hear him say, if you don't believe me, for what I'm saying, believe me for my work's sake. Just look at what I can do. Just look at the 
power that moves through my body. Just look at the miracles that happen when I come around. Just look at what I produce when I'm in the atmosphere, when I'm in the region. Look at the motion that I bring to people's life. She was looking at somebody that didn't have a real excuse of why their brain would resist. Ah. What would cause your brain, Thomas? I can understand if I went go tell somebody on the outside that didn't be in the boat with him, that didn't eat last supper with him. You was at the last supper. You saw his prophecies come to pass. So I'm getting static from you? You telling me that your antennas can't receive the word of the Lord? What the Holy Spirit is saying is something that you challenge? What you hear from God bothers you? You think that I'm playing with your intelligence? When I tell you that I saw Jesus the other day, you think that I'm coming and I'm playing with your intelligence? That's where you're at, Thomas. Saints, when Jesus showed Thomas, oh my goodness. 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 This 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 is this is this this is Jesus finally granted Thomas his wish, but with a broken heart. Ah. You mean to tell me that I was around you all these years showing you the power that I have and you embarrass me in front of Mary Magdalene. This is a woman I just brought on the scene and she has more faith than you. She has more reliability. She has more strength than you. You was here before her. Before I delivered her from seven devils, you was walking beside me. Jesus granted him his wish, but with a broken heart. See, some of you, are you don't understand this, but Jesus could give you what you want with disappointment in his soul. My goodness. No, no, don't, don't be so quick to rejoice. Ay, 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 ay. When God answers your prayer, Especially if you're somebody that hasn't answered God's prayer. Oh my goodness. Because if, 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 if I didn't answer God's prayer and my prayer got answered. Where is God's heart when he answers me? Oh, Moses, we want fish. We want meat. Moses already know it's not the will of God for y'all to eat this. I, the, the Lord done showed me to give y'all manna. The Lord done showed me to give you what you're supposed to have. But then the Lord doubles back and switches the narrative and tells Moses, no, no, no. I'm going to give them what they want. And Moses is like, this not making sense though. Because you giving them what they want goes against what you want. Oh, oh, oh. You giving them what they ask for goes against what you've been asking for. And Moses had to learn the sarcasm of God. 
which is really the manifestation of his disappointment to his appointments. You got to understand there's two angles to the word appointment. Appointment means that something it has been scheduled for you to attend, like a doctor's meeting, like a, like a meeting, a business meeting, a, 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 a job interview. These are all appointments. Appointments is like a game that you're showing up at. It's like different appointments, a school endeavor that you're attending. These are appointments. But then there's another definition of appointment that deals with you have been selected for a position. Now, now watch this here. This secondary appointment that I just revealed to you. Thomas is in a position. He's been appointed as disciple. Which means this is a carrier of divine knowledge. This is someone that hears conversations of Jesus when he is not in the public. Oh, no, no, no. See, you got to understand what the 12 disciples represent because there were disciples and then there was the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples, they ate meat that the other people was not appointed to eat. You notice the disciples didn't hear Elijah or see Elijah. It was Peter, James, and John, three of the, the 12 disciples that saw Elijah and Moses. So you got to understand the appointment of Thomas. You're experiencing the behind the scenes Jesus. The Jesus that shares his heart in deeper places. You're experiencing the naked Jesus. The Jesus that gives you insight and while nobody is hearing what he's warning them, he's warning you and say, I'm going to be delivered up by the Jews. I'm going to let you know what's going to happen next. The Jesus that takes you to a secluded place and eats with you, call it the Last Supper. And he says, somebody at this table going to betray me. Nobody on the outside knows that somebody is going to betray. But Thomas hears it. Thomas heard Jesus blatantly say, after three days I will rise. So when Mary Magdalene comes to Thomas, and Thomas has this reaction, Thomas has to betray his appointment. Now, if you betray your appointment, which is your position, you Betray your appointment, which is your provision. I told you there's two types of appointments that we're dealing with right here. There's the appointment where you're scheduled to be somewhere, but then there's, a, there's an appointment where you're scheduled for a position to be something. So when he disconnects himself from the appointment, meaning the position he's been selected to have as disciple, he also disconnects himself from the appointments, meaning provisions, rewards, harvests, and things that he's supposed to inherit. Wow. Are you hearing me? Wow. Are you hearing me? It's 
So remember every day there's a bigger picture than what you can see. You might be looking at where you live right now. You might be looking at your job. You might be looking at your situations uh, in this natural world. But if you look at the bigger picture, are you betraying the appointment that God selected you in a position and he has anointed you very exceedingly well in that position and if you don't operate if you disconnect yourself from that appointment then all the other appointments they become famished and now here's what happens you start to become confused and start to misjudge God correctly. Because what you're saying, why I don't got the house? Why my body not healed? Why I don't have joy here? Why I don't have deliverance here? Why I don't have progress here? But if we go back to your history. Are you a Thomas or a Mary Magdalene? Are you a Thomas or a Mary Magdalene? Because Mary Magdalene, not only did she succeed in the appointment, the position she was given by Jesus, but she superseded it and she got to all the other appointments. You notice she is the first one to see Jesus' angels. So she goes to the tomb and she steps into appointments because she is outperforming in her appointment. My goodness. So the outperformance that she has in her Appointment, the position selected to her, she is the only one getting to her appointments, which are things, places, and people that she's supposed to meet. She met Jesus' angels. Which disciple can you say? Met these angels that was at the tomb. None. Only her. It shows you what happens when you're a faithful friend of Jesus. See, one of the outlying effects, how we know that you are faithful with the appointment that you've been selected to walk in is the appointments that you reach. So if I can't see Anything that God wanted to give you, wanted you to enjoy, wanted you to inherit, if I can't see it materializing. And it's been a long period of time. You can measure it out and examine and say, well, what was I appointed to be? And am I, we ain't even got to deal with outperforming. Am I performing correctly? See, because you got to understand outperforming comes from a realm of you've been forgiven much, so you loveth much. Yeah. So uh, somebody may not be able to outperform because they may have a narrative in their mind. I haven't done much for God to forgive me, so I'm not going to really be on fire like that. So there's people that can perform correctly. But see, Mary Magdalene outperformed 
because she remembered I was forgiven much, so let me love much. But she also remembered this. When I was serving Satan, I was all out. If Satan wanted to impregnate me with the baby, I had children. If Satan wanted to marry me, I was married. If Satan wanted to get me high, I was smoking. If Satan wanted to get me drunk, I was drinking. Okay, so I did all these things with high velocity, high commitment, high accept acceptance, high agreement. How much more now I'm on the side of light? Must I take those characteristics and qualities and mingle them with my divinity? The same way I patiently was with a man that didn't even love me. We lived in the same place together. I called him my man. He called me his woman. He didn't have the Holy Ghost. But I sat right there and was patient with him. How dare I come over with the Holy Ghost? And now I'm up there rushing the Holy Ghost, questioning him. But I sat right there with the man. I slept right there in the bed with the man. That didn't even know my God, love my God. And I wasn't questioning and interrogating him. Now I'm walking with my God and I got all these questions and all these plan B's. And I need to understand everything from point A to point B. But how was I in that relationship I didn't understand? Now, now you get over here with the Lord. You trusted people in the female body. You trusted that that woman could be your wife. You trusted that that woman could be your helper. You trusted that that woman could be your friend. But now, that woman didn't turn out to be. Now the Holy Spirit come to you as a man. He talking to you. And you got all these doubts and all these unbelief. But you trusted flesh and blood as a man. How you get over here into the spirit and now trusting God is an issue. See? See? Thomas had a life before Jesus entered into his life. Thomas had a life before a disciple. The wild thing about it is that when he became disciple, according to Jesus' appointment, he never changed life. The life that he lived in the flesh continued. My goodness. There was never a conversion. Who he was before Jesus met him was who he was after Jesus met him. Oh, my goodness. See, there are people today, when Jesus came into your life, there was never another life that you discovered. You continued the life that was with the life that is. The Bible said that you can't eat from the table of God and the table of demons devils, the table of the Lord, the table of devils. And so what we have is people saying, why hasn't this happened yet? The well, Lord told me he's going to do this. But let me ask you something. Why haven't what you told the Lord happened yet? Oh. I've had so many things that the Lord told me would happen, happen. Everything that the Lord told me would happen in my life has happened in my life. I'm constantly placing new goals. But here's what I observed. Everything that I told the Lord that I would do, I did it.
From the time when I started, I told the Lord, if you give me a thousand dollar seed, I'll, I'll sow it. He gave me seven thousand. I started sowing the seven thousand. To things that I told the Lord in secret that I would do. I did it. See, the next time you say, I'm waiting on the Lord to do what he promised me. Ask yourself this one question. Is the Lord waiting on me to do what I promised him? Remember, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man's soul that shall he also reap. You want to reap a promise keeping God while you're a promise dropping son. A promise keeping God while you're a promise aborting agent. You kill your vows to God to give him the reward that he deserves from you. But then you whine. You get jealous of other people when you don't see the reward that you believe God promised you. So saints, Thomas got what he wanted. He wanted to experience physical evidence. He got what he wanted. The Lord gave it to him. But there was something embarrassing that the Lord did to Thomas to make Thomas think. I told you he gave Thomas what he wanted, but he gave it to Thomas with a Broken heart. Jesus' heart was broken. There's nothing that breaks Jesus' heart more than faithlessness. That's why the Bible said without faith is impossible to please God. When you do not have any respect for what he says to you, he doesn't want to keep talking to you. He gave Thomas, his request, with a broken heart. You know what he told him? John chapter 20, verse 29 says something shocking. You know what the Lord told him? He said, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But blessed is he. That have not seen, but yet believe. The sword hit Thomas's soul, the reins of his heart. And in that one moment, Thomas began to weep inside. Jesus just told Thomas, there is a people that's better than you. There's a people that I'm not going to have to work as hard as I had to work with you. I'm not going to have to wrestle with their brain. I'm not going to have to earn their respect. They're not going to be up there interrogating me on what I prophesy, on what I promise, on what I told them I would do. When I say it, it's already done in their mind. There's coming a people. Jesus disrespected Thomas. See, some of y'all never saw it like this. Jesus told Thomas, I'm going to give you what you want. But there's a people. I ain't going to have to do none of this. They're going to please me with my investment in them. When I tell them something and the time comes with what I tell them, I'm not going to be battling with them. To believe what I said. When I test them. I'm not going to be repeating myself. They already going to take me. 
at face value. I'm not going to have to keep on babying them. I'm not going to have to look at their years later and say, wait, you doing what I warned you not to do? You have become what I was warning you not to become. Now you are following a lifestyle that I was trying to prepare you to say no to? Jesus was telling Thomas, and he called him by name, Thomas, you believe because you have seen. But blessed is he that's coming. There's a people coming. They're going to not see what you see, but yet they're going to believe. They're going to be at a higher reaction. They're going to be on a higher psychology. They're going to be on a higher level of friendship. They're going to embrace my word the first time. I'm not going to be coming back to them and saying, I already told you not to get in the serpent's venom. I already told you not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. I already told you not to take from the enemy's camp, Aiken. That when you take of the enemy's camp, don't take of the enemy's camp. I already told you to kill the Amalekites, King Saul. I already told you to speak to the rock, Moses. I already told you. Jesus, he gave Thomas his request. But it was a sour place because Thomas never gave Jesus Jesus' request. And all Jesus requested was he that believeth upon me, John chapter 7. As the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. All Jesus was telling him to believe on me. John chapter 14, he that believeth on me, the works I do, he will do also, and even greater works. All he was telling Thomas was to believe on him. He refused to give Jesus Jesus' request. So Jesus gave Thomas Thomas' request. But Thomas didn't give Jesus. Jesus' request. What I want to ask you, is your life going to end off that it was written that you were a person that lied to God? You lied when you said thank you because you never served. You lied when you said I love you because you never gave. You lied when you said that you surrendered because you still catered to your ego. You lied when you said that you trusted him because you never left your logic. You lied when you said that you was faithful because you never kept your instructions. You lied when you said that you was pure because you never stopped hanging around people that hated your God. You listened to their same theology. You agreed with their same narratives. It was right to you like it was right to them. You said that that friend was crazy, but yet she had your phone number. And you spent countless moments in her presence. You said, oh, she wild. She she wild. She nothing like me. You know, I'm nothing like her. But you and her found fellowship with one another. At the end of your life, is it going to be documented that you lied? To God. You didn't keep your promise. 
You said with your own mouth that you wanted his will. And when his will begin to speak to you, you argue with it. When his will begin to touch you, you begin to wipe off the touch. I don't want no germs. I don't want to get infected with righteousness. I, I don't want to get a, 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 a holiness cold. I don't want a virus of submission to come off on me. I, I'm the type of person that like to voice my opinion. I like to, I like to speak my peace and express myself. So I, I, I don't want, I don't want to catch no humility. At the end of your life, will the final verdict be upon you that you didn't keep your vows? You didn't pay your vows to God. You said you was going to do it. You never did it. You said that you was going to become it. You never became it. And you know the gift that God gave you? He gave you time. He gave you time and tests. Because time allow you to prepare. But tests allow you to perform. Oh my goodness. So he gave you time, but then he gave you tests because you had preparation and now performance. And you took the time and the time manifested that you was lying. You took the tests and the test manifested that you was lying. Now you understand why the word of God said that liars will inherit the lake of fire. See, when you hear liars, you, you probably think, oh, um, the lying is just like somebody telling me they're going down the street. Or, or, and they didn't go down the street. We often look at lies like it's just like universal on the earth. But there are people going to hell because they lie to God with their life. I praise you, Lord, but then you still celebrate the world. You know, praise means celebration. Lord, have your way, and then when he have your way, have his way, you call God a racist. You call him a liar. You call him a trickster. You call him everything in the book when you prayed with your own mouth for him to have his way. Then when he have his way, you persecute him. Saints, let's go here lastly. I, I, I need to go here lastly because I was reading this. I, I want to go here lastly before we get off here. This will start off the New Testament. The New Testament started off with Matthew. And I was reading this. Let's, let's close this off with this. Because this was shocking. I was reading this. Look what it says here. Matthew chapter 27 said this, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Now the chief priests were pastors, bishops, people that was over synagogues. They were chief priests. Do you understand? They were priests and elders. These are the same terms that we have in church today. So these were church folk. Church folk was pushing for Jesus to be killed. Saints, may I say this strong statement to you? Church folk is still trying to kill Jesus. People that believe that they go into church have the highest potential to seek to murder Jesus 
and his will in the earth. It's them as it was then, still today. Wow. Look what the text said. It said, when they had bound Jesus in verse 2, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Let's go to verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed Jesus, when he saw him, he took When, when he had saw, when, which had betrayed him, when he had saw that he was condemned, he repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Let's go even further. I need somebody to share this broadcast right now. Everybody share this broadcast as you're on. Look at verse 3. Then Judas, when he had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver. Let me, let me explain verse 3 to you. Do you see what it says? It says, when he saw he was condemned. What does that mean? It says that when he saw he was condemned. What does it mean that he saw he was condemned? He saw the harvest for mishandling all of the moments where Jesus was giving him power to avoid this. He gave him power to be a disciple. He gave him power to learn. He played around. He did what he wanted to do, made his own decisions, had his own reactions, kept his own perceptions. He never accepted the will of God. I want you to see this. Remember what John chapter three say that he that believeth not in me is already condemned. He's condemned. Which means that he didn't believe nothing that Jesus was saying. When Jesus would say something, he was suspicious. Oh, oh. He was judgmental. Everything that Jesus was saying and doing was a joke to him. So when the Bible say he had saw he was condemned, he finally seeing this is what it all harvests. I'm in big trouble. Let's go even further. Verse 3 said that he tried to give back the 30 pieces of shield, uh, uh, the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. Verse 4, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. This powerful. I'm about to get off of here. This powerful. This going to shock you. Watch this here. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. What they were saying, you handle that yourself. Verse 5 says that, and he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. He went and hanged himself, which means that he committed suicide. Let me show you what the Lord showed me. In order for you to hang yourself, you have to put a rope around your neck. And you have to force the rope around your neck until oxygen stops flowing and you can't breathe. This is what Judas had did during the duration of time while he was with Jesus. He kept the yoke that Satan had placed around him before he met Jesus. He kept it around his neck. It blocked the air supply of the word of the Lord that was supposed to enter into his heart. He never let it get inside of his heart. He would block the supply. So he would strangle 
the anointing to be Jesus' friend and to keep Jesus' word. He, kept, he was successful in blocking the changes that Jesus wanted to see in him. Blocking Jesus' request. Blocking Jesus' instruction. Blocking Jesus' commandments. Let me show you something. This is powerful. So Judas had hanged himself before, mentally, before he hung himself physically. He had already was hanging himself all the times he was with Jesus. He was already committing suicide, which is self-destructive behavior, despite Jesus there to give him life and life more abundantly. He was already killing himself. How he spent his time, he was killing himself. The Bible said Judas would go inside of Jesus' bag and take some money from there. He was already committing suicide with what he was doing while he was around Jesus. It's going to get even more shocking than this. Verse 6 says, The chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for them to be pit in the treasury because it is the price of blood. Wow. They took counsel and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in there. Verse 8 says, wherefore the field was called the field of blood unto this day. Okay, verse 9. Then was fulfilled which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet. All right, let's go even further. This is where I want to get to. This is where I want to go. Let's go to verse 11. Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, saying, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus said unto him, Thou sayest. Verse 12. It says, When he was accused of the chief priests, the pastors, the major bishops, the major church figures, when he was accused of the chief priests, and the elders, he answered nothing. Then said Pilate unto him, Hearest thou how many things they witness against you? Look at what Jesus' response was. Verse 14 says, And he answered him, Not a word. In so much that the governor marveled greatly, which means that the governor was shocked, astonished, thinking about what who is this? How is it he not defending himself when people are saying these things about him and I have a chance to release him if he just says that is not true? And Jesus didn't say nothing. Let's go even further. Look what it says right here in verse 15. Now at the feast, the governor was supposed to release unto the people a prisoner, which they chose. Verse 16, they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Verse 17, therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto the people, who will ye that I release unto you. Who do you want me to release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? I, I, want you, I want to hit you with this. Verse 18. Look at this. It says, for he knew that for envy they had delivered him. What does this mean? Pilate knew in his heart that they was only doing this because they was envious of Jesus. 
Some of you all don't know the danger of being envious of another person. It blinds you from the will of God. When you have envy in your heart, your ability to see what God sees is cut off from you. When you envy another woman or another man, you'll fall into your own snares and traps. Because envy is blindness. And when you're blind, you won't see what Satan has on the path to trick you. That's why envy is a device that Satan uses so that you'll miss the will of God for your life and end up in the lake of fire. And if you don't end up in the lake of fire to get you into a path where you suffer on the earth. You now live a life that you was never supposed to live all because you yielded to envy. You was envious of that man. So you went go start a ministry and God didn't call you to start no ministry, but you envy him. You want to do what he does. Envy will make you an entrepreneur of a lifestyle that is deadly. Envy will make you an entrepreneur of a lifestyle that's deadly. Envy will make you an entrepreneur of a lifestyle that's deadly. Let's get, go even further into those, this wisdom. Look what it says right here. It said that Pilate knew that they was envious of Jesus. So they wasn't doing this to Jesus because he was guilty. They was doing it to Jesus because their envy wanted to see he be unsuccessful. His envy, their envy wanted to see him suffer. Let's go to verse 19. It says, and when he was set down on the judgment seat, listen to this. I'm about to give you a powerful revelation, a prophetic revelation. His wife sent unto him, saying, have nothing to do with this man. For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. And I want to I wanna leave this with you. When you are not in peace with God, in his will for your life, stop acting like you're not going to have demonic dreams. And stop acting like your dream world is not going to be affected. Stop acting like every time you have a dream, it is something that's going to be delightful and it's going to be pleasant because if you're not in a right place with Jesus, it will affect your dream world. Look at what she said. She said, I have suffered many things in my dream because of him. There's people, they're not at peace with Jesus, and then they'll be up there talking about, oh, the Lord showed me this in a dream, or oh, he's going to do this in a dream. Oh, okay. This lady said, I have suffered many things in my dream. See, some of you all begin attacked in your sleep. But you also are not a submissive person to Jesus. The Holy Spirit can't lead you without you pinning up a fight. And you expect your dream world not to be affected. Imagine being deceived while you're awake and you think you're not going to be attacked while you sleep. I'm going to say this real slow. Imagine being deceived while you're awake. And then thinking that you're not going to be attacked while you sleep. Let's go to verse 20. So verse 19 leads me to my next point. That your dream world is affected 
When you do not have peace with God and when you're not at peace with God's will and you're not in agreement, you are not successfully submitting and surrender your life to the Holy Spirit for him to do what he wants. Your dream world will be affected. My observation of man is that man be having dreams while they're in rebellion towards God. And those dreams cause them to suffer. Now you have scriptural reference of why this happens. So the next time you start having nightmares and bad dreams and people holding, go back to this text and listen to what this woman, this wife of Pilate said. She told him, let this man go. Let's stop doing him wrong. Because I'm being affected in my dreams. Let's stop mistreating this man that we see. He said that he was sent by God. Let's stop bothering this man. Because it's going into my dream world. I'm suffering. Let's go to verse 20. But the chief priests and the elders, watch this here, they persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. Uh, wait, 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 wait. Let, let, me, let me slow that down. Destroy Jesus. Destroy Jesus. That was the goal. Okay, let's go to verse 21. The governor asked and said unto them, Who should I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Verse 22. Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? And they say unto him, Let him be crucified. Verse 23, and the governor said, why? What evil has he done? The governor is asking them, what evil has he done? Hey, you see what they said? Let's go further. They said, but they cried out all the more, saying, let him be crucified. 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 And they begin to overshadow. Go to verse 24. And when Pilate saw that he could not prevail, but rather a tumult was made. You know, a tumult means like it's a ruckus, it's chaotic, it's outrageous. It says that he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it, was he saying, y'all have your way. You do what you want to do. This is no longer up to me. I left it to you all. You have at it. Saints, listen to this. Verse 25 says something shocking. And I read this. And it had a shocking meaning to it. I'm going to show you. 
It says, then they answered all the people and said, his blood be on us. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and our children. Saints, there's something profound about this. Because though they were saying this for evil, it still was for good. Because when they made this declaration, it was a form of them receiving conviction to repent. They said his blood be on us and our children, which means to destroy the altars of evil that would even have them do this. His blood be upon us, which means that I will switch bloodlines. I will not continue to be evil like this. No, no, no. They was not saying this. Hear me. Hear me. They was not saying this with this interpretation. But I'm telling you that when you say that Jesus' blood be upon you, you might have meant it for evil, but it becomes good because when his blood is upon you, you won't lust no more. When his blood is upon you, you won't fear no more. When his blood is upon you, you won't miss the mark no more. Your children won't live in the sins that you committed. You destroy generational curses and altars. When his blood is upon you and your children, it starts a new lineage of righteousness and willingness and obedience and the blessing is restored and restoration of joy of salvation is restored because his blood is a perfect blood. 